Okay. Well, Sarah, we are so excited to have you on the podcast. Lauren has actually been talking about you for so long and she's like, man, I want Sarah on the podcast so bad. And I think it's really great because you just have a lot of knowledge, first of all. And second of all, you're just such a good representative of truth. We'll put it that way. You wrote a response to the CES letter and we've actually referenced the CES letter many times on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of um, followers who will say, you know, what is the CES letter? I really don't want to Google it, but I think it's really important for people to be prepared if, and when they do encounter the CES letter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they have family that does, like, I think it's important to look at it from a faithful lens and it's so great to have you on and just be able to chat with us about this. So thank you for taking the time with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. And I, I completely agree. I think it's very important to be able to look at that and, and know what it's going to say before you encounter it. Because if you're reading that for the first time packaged the way that it's packaged in, in the CES letter, it's going to throw you. Mm -hmm. 100%. Lauren, would you mind reading Sarah's bio so that we can kind of give her a little bit of an intro? Sarah Allen is a single sister currently living in Utah. She studied journalism and history in college and works in mortgage compliance and fraud. In her spare time, she loves to write. She volunteers with FAIR, where she is a senior researcher and was the 2022 winner of the John Taylor Defender of the Faith Award. She writes for their blog and will be starting a podcast for them soon. She also co-moderates the LDS subreddit on Reddit and is a mentor with the Cavalry Facebook group for missionaries. If you've heard of her, it's probably because of her response to the CES letter. Well, Sarah... Let's, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and your story. What's your okay. background with your testimony? Have you always had a testimony? Did you ever have any struggles with your testimony? What does that, what does that look like? Um, well, I was born in the church. My family's both, I'm, I'm both sides of the family. They go back clear to the beginning. I have always had just that, that feeling inside telling me that the church is true. Um, in fact, even when I was praying for my testimony, you know, when you're a teenager and everybody's encouraging you to get your own testimony and everything, I was trying to get an answer and I wasn't getting the same answer that I, I normally got. And so I, I was getting a little frustrated because it, it, I was just being a dumb teenager and I just didn't clue into the fact that if I had received that a million times before, maybe that was my answer already. <laughs> but um, then I had a, a new family move into the ward and they were giving their talks, their introduction talks. And the sister said, you know, when she had been praying for her testimony, her answer was, you already know it's true. And I went, oh, light bulb. Yeah, I do already know it's true. Um, <laughs> I, I, I did go inactive for a while. Uh, that was not for testimony issues, but it, it was uh, just, I, I was working the graveyard shift at the time. And church was at like 4 a.m. for me and I just could not stay awake and so I would just go home and go to sleep most of the time and so um, I, I did end up going to active for a while and then Heavenly Father kind of shoved me back into things <laughs> um, and about the time I started getting back into the church was about the time I started poking around on Reddit and that's where I discovered there was a church community on there and so I'd go hang out there and talk to people there while I was reactivating myself. I love that. Okay. So what, what was that timeline like? Like what, how long have you been back and been such an advocate for truth? And um, I, I, yeah, I was inactive for like eight or nine years. I mean, it was a long time. I have been back since around 2008 ish. Awesome. Love it. Well, cool. Let's, let's go ahead and jump in. I know Lauren, I know you want to ask the first question because it's your question. So you go ahead and get started. Thanks. Okay. So I haven't personally read the CES letter. I've poked around with things. So I've heard this and I just wanted to kind of clarify it with you because going into the CES letter, I just thought that this guy, Jeremy, had all these questions and he wrote them down and sent them in. I was under the impression that they were like organic questions from him, but I later 
heard that it was really just a compilation of pretty much anything you can find online mm -hmm. that's anti that he organized and put into this letter and sent it in. So I was just wondering if you could clarify, you know, what where, where it really came from, what it is. Yeah. So um, if you look back on his old posts on Reddit from when he first created his account, he was already working on it and like he was compiling it into this document because he wanted to give it to his kids and he actually said at one point I didn't write it for the CS director I wrote it for my kids um so he, he wanted to give his children something that they could look at and see why he was leaving the church and so he did compile everything he could find the first version it's, it's gone through like four I think three or four edits to be what it is now the very first version that he posted online was a lot of it was taken directly out of um, Grant Palmer's and Insider's view of Mormon origins or whatever it's called. And then there's a lot of stuff from Gerald and Sandra Tanner and stuff from Mormon Think and all of the big anti stuff he could find. He ran it past a Reddit group and while he was working on it, he was part of a private Facebook group that nobody has access to what they were doing in that group, but that's what he was working with while he was creating this document. And then um, his grandfather was friends with a CES director and asked him to help answer some of Jeremy's questions in an attempt to keep him in the church. At that point, Jeremy was already like on Reddit, he was asking for help and how to keep the church from brainwashing his children and how to how to rescue them from the church and things so he was he was already mentally long out of the church and really didn't want to listen to this guy but he decided to humor his grandfather because he loves his grandpa and yeah i'll give him credit for that um so he wrote the introductory letter part and cobbled all of these questions he'd been writing in this document he'd been working on and just kind of packaged it as a letter and sent it off to this guy and apparently the guy never answered him because I'm sure he took one look at it and went, yeah, this guy doesn't want answers at all. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that kind of then became the story that he snowballed because he knew that people were interested in it. And like the story would catch their interest. And so, you know, of, of this poor guy who was just desperately looking for answers and nobody would give them to him. And, you know, the church was hiding stuff from him and refused to help him. And, <laughs> you know, that piques people's sympathy and makes them want to to listen to him and to reach out and help him and that draws more people into reading it so that kind of snowballed from there and that's the story that he insists is what happened but if you look back on his old stuff that's not what he was saying thank you for uh that clarification <laughs> because sure <laughs> Yeah, I know personally a lot of people that have left the church over the CES letter or that was the yeah. thing that initially was the started it yeah mm -hmm. yeah I myself have not read the CES letter and I'm sure that, you know, any anti people that are watching this are going to say that I should read it in order to have right. like both sides. But like Lauren said earlier, first of all, I don't have time for that. It's way too long. Second of all, I already know what it says because I've interviewed enough people that have left over <laughs> seven CES letters. Right. Right. And third of all, I actually just don't really have any desire because I have my own personal experiences that have really shaped my testimony. And Sarah, I know you probably don't know much about my story, but I was a heroin addict and came back to the church. Oh, and that, wow. Yeah. And that saved my life. And so I can't really deny how the church completely transformed my heart and my life and the gospel being something that has given me such a greater purpose. And so it's like the CES letter doesn't really have any, like <laughs> just no desire. Like I just, I don't have right. any desire. So anyway, I, I really appreciate you uh, clarifying that. So what what was it that sparked your interest in creating a rebuttal to the CES letter? Uh, well, eventually, after poking around Reddit for a couple of years on those communities, um, I, I became a moderator on the LBS sub. And we would get tons of people asking questions about it, and we'd get trolls telling us to read it, and we would get people like just dropping the link in and running away, and we would get people who 
pretended to be looking for answers to the questions, but they weren't. And they, they would like try to hide it, but they would be quoting directly from it. And we knew exactly what they were doing because we'd all read it. And we were like, we're not fooling anybody, you guys. Um, but then there were other people that were obviously very sincere about it and had, had they stumbled across it or somebody gave it to them and they read it and they were just really struggling. There are already a bunch of other replies to it. Some of them were better than others at, at answering certain questions and then they would be less effective at, at certain questions. And some of them were just brief overviews because the, the authors had written books and most of the content was in the books. So they were, documents were just a brief overview of the details. And there was none that was like really, really deep and comprehensive and really focused on it. And so I started thinking that it would be a good idea if somebody did that. And then Heavenly Father said, okay, go ahead. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it didn't mean me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he had other plans and he leaned very heavily on me for a few months and finally I was like okay fine so I sucked it up and I started working on it and I kind of had a different idea at first of what I wanted to do I, I was thinking it was just going to be just kind of like a, another kind of broad overview but I, I was hoping that I would get other people in the comments like offering their versions and their links and their research and stuff so we could compile like a big database kind of thing and nobody really did except for one one or two guys <laughs> so it, it kind of fell on me and then people were like well you, you know um if you look at my first couple entries they, they kind of they hit on the main points but they don't go line by line i had a bunch of people going well why aren't you addressing everything he says he said it's like okay fine so it, it kind of snowballed into something much bigger than I had anticipated it being. Mm, awesome. So when I initially started the podcast and I posted about it on social media, mm -hmm. I got so many anti-Mormons coming at me that I almost was like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> like so <laughs> heavily. And it hasn't, that swarm hasn't come for me as heavily it did on TikTok, but I thought it was really interesting that 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 happened right when I announced the podcast. Did you experience that? Just that opposition? Like do people just yeah. coming for you? Yeah. Yeah. At first I, I was just posting them on Reddit. So I got a bunch of people on Reddit coming after me. Um, the, the Mormon subreddit. Um, a couple of people on there tried to dox me before my name was on it and before anybody knew who I was. The real opposition came when Fair started reposting them. And one of my co-moderators on Reddit, he, he's a longtime volunteer with Fair. And I, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to dox him. He took the posts to Scott Gordon, who was the president of Fair, and he liked them. And so they asked me if I would repost them on Fair. And that meant I would have to put my real name on them and I'd have to put my picture on them and they'd have to be like officially mine and, and not just these anonymous Reddit posts that they were before. So after that, Jeremy started writing a response to me on his website, on the Mormon Stories website. When you go to the first website on the homepage there, they have like the, the current news of the day and my face was all over there and he was telling his followers to go harass me all over social media and flood it with Jeremy's oh. response to me. And so I had to lock down all my social media accounts and people were threatening me and threatening my family. And it was, oh it was insane. God. It was so ridiculous. Damn. I know. And, and I'm used to being anonymous and not rocking the boat. So that was a, a very new experience for me. It took a, a while to adjust to suddenly everybody knowing who I was. Mm. That was weird. Yeah, that is really, really <laughs> challenging. What do you consider to be the biggest issues that people have from reading the letter? There are certain things that he harps on a lot that are, that are his personal issues, but I think the main thing that most people come across is they are seeing something different in that letter than what they had always been taught. And so for them, there's that disconnect and they don't know how to deal with it. So they, they don't know who they can trust and they don't know what to believe and they wonder why they never heard about stuff in church. I think that's probably the biggest issue that people run into. And then what is your response to that? You know, when people are so just blindsided by the CES letter, what is your response to that? I would say, you know, church is the primary goal of church is to point us towards Christ. And 
you know, is to help foster that community so we can support each other. And it's not really so much about teaching history. I can understand why they don't talk about it as much in church, but I do think that a lot of this stuff does need to be talked about a little more openly than it has been. And so I'm very grateful to our, our current brethren today because they are really pushing opening up everything and making sure everybody has access to everything but that information was always out there and the church was always publishing it it just wasn't reaching a very wide audience part of that was because some of the stuff were things that uh, some of the the brethren who lived 50 years ago didn't believe so they, they didn't want to spread what they thought was false information um, and that it later turned out to be true, like the the Joseph Smith using his personal seer stone. Because I, I know that kind of threw a lot of people. There was a space of about 40 years and like five or six generations of people who grew up never hearing that at all. And that really rocked a lot of people. So yeah, it, it, it was always out there. Like I had read basically everything in the CS letter before I read the CS letter itself. I'd, I'd already come across all of that stuff just in my own city because because i am a big nerd and I, I love history and i love reading and you know so mm -hmm. I, I had come across all of that stuff before but a lot of it wasn't like well publicized so a lot of people didn't know about it and i so i, I completely understand why they were upset about it mm. so yeah. if you had already read everything then why didn't it bother you why didn't you want to create your own ces letter um, well, I had read it from church sources, first of all, so it was, it was presented to me in a, a faithful way. And part of it uh, was just different assumptions. Like, I think Jeremy was very kind of fundamentalist in his thinking, and he really believed that things had to be an exact certain way. And I have always been a little bit more open to, to being wrong than that. So for me, I, I was 12 years old the first time I learned about Joseph Smith's Seer Stone. And the first time I read it, I went, oh, that's really weird. I'd never heard that before. What What is this even talking about? Within about five minutes, uh, you know, the spirit was like, does it really matter if he used like one stone or two stones? Or, you know, I was like, oh, no, it, it really doesn't. <laughs> so for me, it was just easier to just be like, oh, okay. But I can see why somebody else who might have different assumptions, and especially because I studied a lot of history, and history is very messy, and we don't have very concrete sources for a lot of things. So a lot of it, um, you just have to kind of read between the lines on a lot of things, and there are gaps, and there are contradictory sources and things. So when I hear that prior prophets had read some of those sources and didn't believe them because it was so like there were contradictory sources. I completely get that. I'm like, okay, yeah, they, they just saw something different and that doesn't bother them or it doesn't bother me. If you read through the CES letter, Jeremy is very rigid about what he believes. And if, if something is not exactly the way that he imagined it was, then it's all wrong. Mm -hmm. He just throws the entire thing out. And so it's just different personalities, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I don't remember hearing about the seer stone when I was little, but mm -hmm. I don't even remember when I did hear about it because I just was like, oh, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it didn't, I didn't even phase me. And I mean, they're like, I've talked about it in previous episodes, so I won't go into it again, but I had my own moment where polygamy really kind of mm -hmm. just rocked me a little bit. And when I was reading the saints book, the way that I processed and worked through that like oh my gosh that's kind of like creeps me out a little bit it actually like turned out to be something that strengthened my testimony so much like it turned <laughs> out to be that by turning to god and asking you know why this was this way it actually was such a testimony builder for me as opposed to something that harmed my testimony and i think that can be the result of people turning to faithful sources and praying and asking God, mm -hmm. like, why? And I love what you said oh, about yeah. history being so messy because it is so messy. It's like, it doesn't matter if we're looking at the church or if we're looking at something else, history mm -hmm. is messy. And, you know, you have different people remembering things in a different way and just 
things yeah. stuck out to people in different ways. And when we had Don Bradley on the podcast, that was a great, obviously, you know him, and that was a great yeah. example of that. Yeah, I, I love Don. He's great. And no, I, I completely agree. What I do when I come across something that I don't fully understand is I ask Heavenly Father for understanding so that I can see why it happened the way that it happened. And usually he tells me. Uh, sometimes it takes a couple months of, of earnest questioning and, and earnest seeking and studying, but he always points me eventually to the right direction. I love that so much. Have you had any personal spiritual experiences while you've been working on this project? I mean, it seems like at first glance, it's like you're diving into the, your eyeballs deep and all this material antagonistic to the church. And it can be seem maybe challenging to have spiritual experiences. So just, you know, curious if you've had spiritual experiences while. I've had basic little things like. You know, I, I remembered that I had read a source somewhere and then I forgot to write it down. And so I was trying to find the source again and I couldn't find it. And so I would say a prayer and asking Heavenly Father to help me find that source again. And he would point me to a better source that had more information. It was even better than the one I had before. So there were little things like that. But the act of diving in and reading the church history and studying the church history and studying the words of the prophets and studying the scriptures and like trying to tie it all together. That strengthened my testimony so much. And it wasn't even very shaky before, you know, it, it was pretty solid before, but that just, it, it was a huge testimony builder for me. So cool. I love how you're so called to this work to do this. And oh, well, thanks. <laughs> so were there any items within the letter that Jeremy knew had already been disproved, but were added to overwhelm readers? Yes, <laughs> several things. The clearest example that I always point to is there was this list that he was cobbling together, like this graph, uh, showing all of the reasons why Joseph Smith supposedly borrowed it from the view of the Hebrews. Uh, which is one of the the theories out there. Um, there's this book written by somebody that Oliver Cowdery, you may have known, that talks about uh, Jewish people being in the Americas, but I mean, it's completely different from from the Book of Mormon. And uh, the, the church actually published, you can read it on BYU's website right now for free. But he was cobbling up together this list showing all of the comparisons between the two. And one of them that he said was that the View of the Hebrews was published in this certain county in Vermont, and the Book of Mormon was first published in the neighboring county in Sharon, Vermont, for the first time. And his linked source takes you to the copyright page of the Book of Mormon, where it says right on there, first published in Palmyra, New York in 1830. So he says, he knows it's untrue. His own source says it's untrue. Everybody in the world knows. If they know anything about the Book of Mormon, they know it was published in Palmyra. You can go visit the printing press, like the, the site there is a tourist attraction. You know, this is not obscure information. And it has been pointed out to him numerous times. And he always says, you know, if there's anything that's in true in this, tell me and I'll change it. But he's been told that hundreds of times and he hasn't changed it. It's been there through every iteration of this letter so far. And it is blatantly untrue. Um, and that's just one thing. There, there are others. There's a section where um, he cobbled together this list of how Joseph Smith supposedly stole names for the Book of Mormon from different neighboring cities around him. It has been pretty thoroughly debunked by a lot of people over the years. It is one of the weakest sections of the CS letter. He knows it. Like there's a big post on Reddit where Jeremy was like, this is easily the weakest part of it. I'm thinking of taking it out on the next version. But everybody was like, oh no, that, that really affected me. That's what led me out of the church. So he left it in and he knows it's weak. He knows it's stupid, but he left it in because other people told him that, that it made an impression on them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He's framing it one way to, to hook people in and draw them in. And, and so arrange it in a certain way so that it wouldn't doom its success when it goes viral and stuff. And he's like, it just went viral on its own. I had no hand in that. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> you can look back at his old comments and see that's exactly what he was doing. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always quote my sources and I always say who they are and I was linked to where I got that information from. And he, there are passages in the CS letter that he does lifts wholesale right out of books and websites and stuff. And he doesn't attribute to anybody. And I'm like, 
that is plagiarism. Citing something is the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> so, oh my, that is I, I just thought that was hilarious. I was like, really? <laughs> Oh, like, I can I can point I can point to paragraphs in the CS letter that he lifted word for word from like Grant Palmer or from Mormon Think or something, and there's no attribution at all. He he presents it like he, he was the one writing it. So, what is the most important thing that you would like to tell people about the letter? Like, I mean, specifically our audience who may or may not know about what it says, or what what would you like people to know about it? first of all, it is packaged to be as damaging as possible. So dig into the actual truth of things. Do your own studying. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Jeremy's word for it. Look it up for yourself. Figure it out. Talk to Heavenly Father. Keep him in the loop. And you don't have to be scared of church history. And you don't have to be scared of coming across something that might rattle you because Heavenly Father will help you through it. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And I, I found that to be true so much because we come across stuff all the time. You know, Mm -hmm. now that we're doing the podcast, we come across all kinds of things people say to us or people that, that are talking about why they left and, you know, things that rattled their testimony, especially on our earlier episodes. And that's such great advice. So thank you for saying that. Sure. It's how I handle things when I have questions. You know, I, I do my own studying and I look at things from different sides, but I always lean on Heavenly Father too. And I always keep him in the loop. And I always tell him what I am questioning and what I'm struggling with. And he always points me to sources that help. You know, sometimes it, it takes a while. Sometimes the answers don't come right away, but he always points me to something that eventually helps me to understand things or helps me feel at peace about it, even if I don't fully understand it, or he, he always eventually helps me resolve it in some way that I can, I can deal with it and move on. I love that. So for anybody that doesn't know what FAIR is, you've mentioned FAIR quite a few times. Tell listeners what FAIR is and what they can use FAIR for. So you can find FAIR at fairlatterdaysaints.org. Um, It is basically a Wikipedia of sorts with a ton of information about any question you might have about church history. There is tons of scholarship. There are links to full resources. They have the entire Journal of Discourses on there. They have presentations. Uh, They do hold a conference every year where they have people get up and talk about research, the current research that's going on, and they talk about there's the blog that I write for. Um, I'm doing a response right now to the letter from my wife, Lauren, that you were talking about. Tell us what that um, is. I And I've heard of it <laughs> several times, but tell explain to us what that is. Okay. So after Jeremy's CS letter came out, there were a whole bunch of other copycat letters that came out. And that was one of them. And that is kind of the, the second most popular one. It's less hostile and its tone is a lot more neutral. And so when they know that Jeremy's outright hostility is going to drive people away and they're not going to listen to the CES letter, they give them the, the letter for my wife because it's, it's a lot more benign on its face. But he uses all of the same manipulation tactics and he gets a lot of things wrong, like factually incorrect, that you just point to the source and say, actually, it, it, it says this, <laughs> you know. Um, so he does that a lot and he miss cites documents like crazy where he, he just gives like the wrong book that, that it came from and things like that and that it couldn't have come from because the statement was made five years after the book was published and things like that mm. there, there's a lot of factually inaccurate information in it and it does use all of the same manipulation tactics and it, it likes to do this thing where it, it doesn't ask questions but it states things and then it just lets it hang there like it's supposed to be this big horrible reveal and you're just like what's the problem with, with that you know mm-hmm. <laughs> so um that that one was a little different and I, apparently uh, the wife in question was extremely upset that he would dare use their marriage for something like that and uh, it, they are divorced now, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Got that. Out of curiosity, how do you keep yourself so 
separated from all the <laughs> like I feel like for me I like focusing on the comeback side of people's experience like <laughs> it's actually like really amazing and testimony building to hear people come back after they've been so just depleted by the CES letter or okay. blindsided by you know all of these different things and then to hear their come back from it is like so empowering and so how do you keep yourself like immunized from all these dark voices that are just like coming at you so there are a lot of times I have to get up and, and walk away and take a break because it, it really is you feel just this oppressive just gross dirty feeling I feel like I have to take a shower a lot like I have to shower multiple times a day when I read this stuff is the way it makes me feel. I find it's really important to take a break and do something enlightening. Like I'll reach for my scriptures and just take a break to read through my scriptures. Or sometimes when it got a little overwhelming in the CS letter, I would take a break and for a week and focus on a talk that I loved and just go through it and talk about that instead of talking about this stuff in the CS letter. That really helped whenever I was feeling especially worn down and beaten down by it all. And praying, praying helps a lot. Um, just immersing yourself in good, faithful, positive things. You have to take your break occasionally because it, it just makes you feel gross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was actually just talking to my husband about that because I, I see so many anti stuff because of the algorithm mm -hmm. on YouTube. It's yeah. not, I don't seek for it. I don't follow any of them, but like, I'm always seeing and I was telling my husband the other day that like when I was starting to read that letter to my wife, nothing on like a factual basis did I see any issues with what was being said. None of it was like bothersome to me, but it still came with like this dark spirit. Yeah. I, I hadn't had my testimony shaken in any way by what I read. But there was still this gross heaviness and like, yeah, just uh, in church yesterday in testimony meeting, I was just, you know, it's New Year's, so everybody's getting up there. And there were so many yeah. like testimony after testimony. And I was like, this feels so good. I have mm -hmm. been and I'm not even that into anti stuff, but I was like, I need to get more into the positive side mm -hmm. because you do you have to counter it. And it doesn't mean that it's true because you feel gross. That's not truth. I think people no. don't use that. They, they do. And there, there's this excellent, excellent talk by um, Elder Lawrence Carbridge called Stand Forever. You can find it. I love that right talk. There. Right. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. Um, and he talks about that, that gloom that you feel mm -hmm. when you read that stuff because it's the absence of the spirit because the spirit runs away when you read that kind of stuff. So it's not the spirit confirming to you that you know, you've been lied to all this time, it's the spirit getting the heck out of there because it doesn't want to be around that disgusting, gross stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, that is what you're feeling is just that void of spiritualness. So you need to counter it by immersing yourself in, in good, positive things like the scriptures and talks that resonate with you and the words of the prophets and just things that uplift you. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us. You are just such an incredible person. And I feel like you've been called to such a unique work that is so needed and so just powerful. I think when people encounter the CES letter online, they're like, they don't know like where to turn, you know, mm -hmm. and you yeah. create this space for people to find something safe and secure and faithful surrounding such a negative dark thing thank you that that's very very kind of you that is always the goal is to try and help people figure things out and, and work things out in their own way and just let them know that there are answers out there and it's not that jeremy couldn't find the answers it's that he didn't want to listen to them yeah um, there, there's a reason why he attacks everybody who tries to give him answers and it's not because they, they don't have good answers to give him is because he doesn't want them. So I, I do feel it's important to just let people know that there are answers out there. And sometimes it takes a bit of work to find them. But if, you know, if you bring God into it and you listen to the spirit and you rely on that, he will eventually help you find those answers. I love that. That's so beautiful. Well, Sarah, is there anything else you want to leave us with before we wrap up today? 
nothing in particular, just that, you know, I, I do know that this church is true. I love this church. And Heavenly Father will answer your questions if you give him enough time and you put in some of the work yourself to find them. He, he will absolutely help with that. I love that. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was such a pleasure having you on. Oh, I had a great time. Thanks guys for inviting me. You're awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. You guys are wonderful too. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.